Hello, welcome to Relove Guitars. It's a Thursday evening and we've got an upside down Mark Knopfler signature. Strat Orchestra under the lights. Now, one of the things I thought I'd do with this guitar is uh, obviously introduce it, go over it, get a look at it. Um, but I'll take you through how I evaluate it um, when I get such a guitar. Now I don't fully know the spec of this one. We've got a tremolo arm in here which has been a bit stripped in the past but it's still working. So we recognize a nice quality Fender neck. <coughs> That's a sort of glossy version, variant. Um, little note observation uh, <coughs> strap buttons, no uh, felts. Just, I don't know, just a tradition. It's got an SE serial number, so I don't know if that's signature edition or something like that, but hey. Single ply uh, cover plate, <coughs> everything else normal, and a bit of a parchmenty coloured scratch plate. Uh, even, I don't know if this is meant to be the case or whether it's just a chance thing, it may just be a detail that's deliberate. And actually, guess what? You won't be able to see it on here for some reason. This is very green. That isn't. That's gold. That's green. It doesn't show up on the phone very well. So we've got two the same colour here and one with green numbers going... Oops, sorry, green numbers going around. It's much greener in real life than it is on this video. Anyhow, so we've got <coughs> a tremolo which is currently set down only at an unknown amount of uh, press. Um, and a, trem a tremolo arm that has stripped inside, Tim was telling me, so it, it kind of works okay. Um, but it either, really, you either have it all the way in and a little bit stiff, or you have it a bit loose, but you've got a bit of wiggle. So we could put, maybe put some um, of that stuff on it that's known as PTFE tape. We, we'll see, but it gets a bit messy sometimes. Now... So first thing is just, this is the visual inspection. So what I can see is, is on this guitar, it's been used, as you can see. It's got scratches, got a lot of scratches all over it. See them? Not so easy to see in this light, maybe better in that light. So quite a bit of scratchery going on there, trying to keep you in focus. Now it's given up. Sorry. Anyway, no, it's really, it's, uh, there we go. A little bit of focus so you can see the scratches in there and the paint's dulled down a bit here as you can see um, so it's not in new condition or anything like that it's you know it's a, a much enjoyed blade guitar with commensurate uh, marks and stuff um, I don't know much about its age or anything like that it's got a what I would suggest is a Corian or you know a synthetic bone nut um, which at the moment is uh, a bit low on, certainly on the A string. But one of the things that's interesting is what we've got here is we've got a, an E string. We've got a, a um, we've got a, a probably a, a D from one gauge. And then we've got a, sorry, we've got, yes, a D string from some gauge pretending to be an A string. And then we've got a slightly thicker string being a D string. And then the wound string so something um somebody's put on the wrong string here in the past but um never mind we shall remove those so looking at this as well we've got a bit of movement on here which we need to take care of but if you start to look closely at the frets what do we know well first of all can you see these vertical marks on the fingerboard that is the sign of somebody pressing down between fret presses pressing down usually on the wood uh, with the the fret holder that goes in the, uh, I think it's called the call, isn't it? The, the brass call. It's usually what causes that. And actually there are quite a few of them showing up here. Or it could be a result of scraping uh, but not continuing the scrape. Um, one of the two things. But I'm noticing that in the second half of the fingerboard mainly, um, it's nothing bad, it's just a, an observation. So all these things, like the line there, can you see it right in the centre now? Um, it's quite pronounced, actually. Um, 
you know, little marks that are telltale signs of maybe what the life that the guitars had um, or anything that's been done to it. <coughs> now, looking at the frets, um, when I am, you know, the first thing I observe is um, is the alignment good? Well, the alignment on the nuts good. There's just about enough room either side. I wouldn't like it any closer to the edge, but that's pretty fine. As we get down here, um, whoops, we don't have a ton of spare room either side. I'm directly over the fingerboard there, and it's not a lot of leeway. Um, so again, it's one of those bridges that, uh, what is the, sorry, clunk. What is the spacing? Let's just have a quick look for peace of mind. Never know on these things. It'll either be a 54 or a 56. <coughs> um, it's not that easy to tell sometimes because you have to judge the center of things. Well, that's not right for a start. <coughs> Thank you. So <coughs> that is, I think that's a 56, judging by that. <coughs> yeah, 56. That's the widest spread that Fender does. I think they do. I don't know if Fender does a 54, but you, you typically, there's about four total range of sizes that I know of in any kind of strap bridge that you've got. Something like the Sun Mustang or the Encore India. Sun Mustang India or the Encore India strats, they are 50 millimeters. That's six millimeters narrower than this. So you can imagine the strings are kind of like that. Um, then you've got 52 and a half, which is most modern copies, Strat copies, um, and I use that quite a lot. Then you've got 54, which is uh, uh, on some Strats, I think, and then you've got 56, which is on this type of model. So it's the widest of them all. So, you know, in my world, would I prefer a 54 and just have a little bit more room here? I would personally, but that's just me. Anyway, so we've had a look at the marks there and we're thinking, hmm, was this from the factory or has somebody refretted since or done some work where they've accidentally kind of clunked the fingerboard? Well, we don't know. So looking at the frets, um, this one's kind of, I suppose, hard, a little harder to see probably on the... Oh boy, look at this. What's going on in this world? Look at this. D Tim's son's guitar yesterday, George, his Epiphone had a similar bunch of little little uh, ruffles on the end of the frets. Can you see them? No, see them? Oh, no, not so much cl clear on there, but that's really interesting. What is that? You can see them on the end of here. See those little marks? That's not, st it's not the strings doing that, it's to the outside. So what is going on? Some funny little... Do you see what I'm getting at? Those little three stripes or two stripes right on the end. And that's what was on the end of the on, uh, the Epiphone frets. Uh, sorry, it's hard to hold this still at such a zoom, So, but there's nothing down here so much. Anyway, so what I'm kind of looking at is just any observation of interesting things um, that I can see. And I'm sort of looking to decide, has this been fret leveled sometime in the past? Um, it, the tops of the frets do have an appearance of being flattened a bit, but the thing is they all look, they all look, mm, sorry you can't see here, they all look mostly universally the same, so there doesn't seem to be any one that's got particular more treatment, so maybe they're just worn flat by playing, although this fret here with the funny marks, got some funny marks on the end? No, not so obvious, no, but this one here, with funny marks, the remnants of the funny marks right there. Uh, that one's a little wider as well. So maybe it's been leveled. Um, but what we've got then is we've got, uh, next thing to look at is a pretty low action, a bit too low on this current D. So we're going to change the nut anyway. Looking from here, the nut is actually appears to me to be leaning towards the bridge. You probably won't get a sense of that. It's probably very minor, but it has a feel when I stand over it. I can sort of sense that it's leaning. Whoops! Uh, it's leaning a little bit in this direction. It's okay. We'll take care of it. I mean, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get you to see what I see from the angle I see it. So if I were to set, where's my eyeballs? Right in between there and there. Uh, 
no, you can't see that. <laughs> anyway, oh look, I've, I'm now I'm trying to give myself some stability here, so I've I've um, pressed the base of this lovely old. Come on, is that not even going to? I think I've lost any hope of focusing. Right, pressing the base of the um, mic holder against my chest, which is probably covered in dirt. Anyhow, so okay, frets, nothing too untoward. Uh, action down this end, fairly high. Um, saddles down here, room for lowering. Um, the, so straight away, I don't think there's a mismatch between getting this down to a target action and this not being able to provide it. I notice that the screws along the um, bridge plate there are all slightly different tension, so I'd want to slack them off a tiny bit more just to be on the safe side. So one of the things I'm going to do, let's just zoom out, because I know this is the wrong string here, I'm going to fit a, a fake, no, not fake, a dummy, no, a throwaway A, because I just want to have the right tension before I do anything else. So I'm getting rid of this string here, which isn't definitely isn't an A, um, which is okay. And luckily I've got some spares knocking about. Let's see if it will come out. This is now going to make life difficult. Oh, please. No, actually, that's no, that is a pain. That doesn't even vaguely line up. Right. <laughs> Sorry. First criticism fender. Barely likely to get those. That's that's a, a, a mm, that's not really brilliant, mind you. It would be different if the tremolo was perhaps in a different setting, but it isn't, and it should be available when it's not necessarily being used. Who knows? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to take this off for a minute. Lay this flat for a minute and then take off these, this, these, this plate. So there was something else that I thought when I saw this guitar I probably needed a look at, but I can't think of what it was. Um, I had a test play and it pickup sounded nice in that fendery sort of way. I don't know what model it uh, pickups, what brand, no, what model number the pickups are or name, but I'm presuming they'd be pretty good. Something like Fat 50s or something, or something classic, if it's a Knopfler red strap. Okay, so there we have a nice solid bridge, um, all looking good. Now what was I doing? Oh yes, I was doing this to remove the string. Now these are Fender bullet strings at the, this point in time. But we'll not necessarily use those on replacing them. We'll, we'll use some uh, uh, Dario's. Um, so in goes this new A string. We might as well keep the back off for the time being until we're all done and completed. Uh, where are we? So with the uh, these strings, I go two two posts past the one, it's about two inches past the post I'm wrapping it onto. And then I stick the end in there, press down to the side, and then, oh blimey, that's going to take me hold fire. I'm going to get my screwdriver and help myself along. So I'm not going to be doing this forever. So all this time when I'm looking at something, I'm just getting a sense of uh, what I think is happening with the guitar. Um, I'm looking for any telltale signs and also matching it with, that's better, that's <laughs> some right size string, um, matching it with anything um, that the owner has, has told me that's worth knowing. Now what I'm going to do at this point is um, I'm going to tune up approximately, it never hurts at any point in the game to tune the guitar up. So 
So first of all tune up, then I'm going to look at the neck relief in this neck. So I hold down the last low E string at the last fret and the first fret and I press down in the around about the middle of the neck on the eighth fret and that's actually quite quite a large amount of relief in the neck. I think it's probably about 0.3 or 4. But let's have a, a little look. It's always kind of nice to know, not that the number matters any, but it it's sort of good to either reconfirm or challenge one's um, assessment of it. So if it's if it's what you think, then you you get better at judging it. Yeah, that's right. That's about 0.5 or even 0.6 of a mil, which is way too much. Or it is quite a lot. It's unnecessarily. Now the thing about this guitar is it's a it's a 7.25 inch radius um, neck. So I think that's just, I think it's, call it a comfortable 0.5 mils. So that should go down to about 0.2 at most really, 0 0.2 to 0.25. So the thing I was going to say is this neck is a vintage style neck, so it'll be a, a 7.25 uh, inch radius. Um, I'm pretty sure, yes, I looked it up, of course it is. Um, 7.25, now there's, there's, a, there's a limitation um, that a tight radius, the most tightest of all commercial radius is the 725. There's a limitation that that has on how low we can set the guitar. Um, so if I were to set it to the normal or the, this, the most common target action, what you'd find is the notes would likely to choke out. Now, you might think, well, level, level your way out of that, Sam, and you'd be right, you pro probably could. Um, some of the way, but you there is a point on a 7.25 where you can't, if you're beyond a certain action here, you just won't get the bends uh, choke free because of the limitations of this action. It, it's about the shape in the cross section of the neck and the way the string starts from down here, ends down here, and the fact that as you bend it, it comes up a hill on the G, what I call the G track, and then it comes back downhill here, which crosses over the fret. And, and cancels out that that action that height differential cat uh, cancels out the tiny bit of clearance there ought to be so there's a limitation so I will always start when I'm doing somebody 7.25 inch radius classic neck the caveat is always um, it's unlikely to be the lowest action of all the guitars I handle uh, it'll have a certain constraint so we've got two millimeters of the high e fret at the moment and we've got we've got close just under 2.5 on the low e which is which is higher than it needs to be so what i would typically whoops sorry about the view that's terrible rubbish camera work. uh what did i say two and 2.5 so two two and 2.5 um the ideal target on a nine and a half inch radius and above uh, tends to be 1.2 that's a, that's the lowest I'll go and I'll aim for um, and 1.5 and then a sort of a radius across between the two or not radius a gradient um, but realistically on this one I would say we are looking at a minimum of 1.75 and 1.5 that would be my target uh, for this guitar now, uh, I know from experience that I can most certainly get there and it still feels overall like a low action um, compared to anything else. So, I would get my adjuster hex keys and I would get my measuring thing over there and I'd start by... Oh, first thing I'd do, let's... let's, let's <laughs> oh, Fender, I hate you. <sighs> We've got too much relief, haven't we? And before I do any fret levelling, I need to put the relief really the way I want it. I mean, you can do it without doing that, but I'd prefer to keep it consistent. And the truth is, we kind of have to do this at some point. So, hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to do heel adjuster again. Um, I hate the heel adjusters. Some people go, oh, it's not that difficult. What you do, you see, is you, you cut away. I'll show you. 
there's this there's an argument that says oh well a heel adjuster <coughs> you don't have to take the neck off completely what you do is you cut away a little bit of your scratch plate and you get a tool in there right well first of all there's no way on the on the merry blue planet earth that you're going to find some tool that sneaks into there sorry sneaks into there yeah oh god can you even see the adjuster there's a screw in there let's see if i can just um all right try this uh, yeah there we are look in there great come on zoom in i'm sorry i really messed up that focus and everything right see in there there's a one side of a, a screw well, one bit of a screw head um, there's nothing i can get in there to turn it uh, i don't think anyway if you have to have an incredible let's just see if i'm just completely wrong I'm going to I'm going to challenge myself because people said, "Oh yes, what you do is you just loosen that off." Right, I've got a little thing there. That's not going to go in there. Uh, I've got a little thing here. Ain't no way that's going in there. Let's get another little thing here. No, that's not going in. Even if I had a little less shaped one that I could get it in, it's going to have to be thinner than that quite some right right okay we haven't got the thing that will do it we've got one of these look how tiny that is now i know it's not quite right but okay i can sort of get a tiny bit of bite but there's no way i'm going to be able to turn that without mashing something i don't think and i really wouldn't want to try i mean could i could i oh, don't want to do it ah that's hurting my thumb that's the bit i chopped off with the scissors you wouldn't believe it hurts so much Right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what I would be tempted to do anyway, or typically would do, is I'm going to slack off the strings so there's not too much pull on them. Keep the uh, that string grabby thing, the capo, on it at the other end. And what did I say? Oh yes, it's too much relief. Right, so now I'm going to load myself up with a screw driver bit, which will undo find the best one which will undo the uh, neck screws and i'm going to slack them off now the question somebody said is you can slack them off and after you slack them off you can keep them in but you can somehow bend the neck <coughs> upwards so let's take a let's say i take the extend the neck pair so that they are uh, out almost uh, and the sorry the neck pair the, the rear pair I, I got to make sure you can see something <laughs> right behind here I can feel that the rear pair are out now the idea is can I oh no of course I can't do that I'm not going to bend rotate this thing around the other screws that are in there now I've got all of them out oh do I want to bend really confidently well yeah look so now I've got tension under the strings how happy am I with that not massive yeah, it's still in the pocket, right? And that's that the only good thing about it. But the truth to tell is it's going to fall out as soon as I let go of it, which I might as well have just done it the way I would be tempted to do it, which is get these screws right out of the way since they're all out anyway. And this is how I do it. Put it down there and go there. Much more comfortable. So that really is the only way to do it. Sorry, all these people who say you can somehow twist and bend things. I don't see any reasonable way you're going to do that. Um, and also, some people say, I'll show you this as well, to prove the point, they go, in the back of the neck heel, there is a space that you can get your... No, there isn't. Look, it's solid. You've got a little hint of a gap there with your scratch plate, which you could widen out if you wanted to, but you are still not going to get a good bite at that thing. So the, I think the safest way to do it, even though it's a bit of a fiddle, and I still don't mind... I'm not apologetic that I am annoyed at the vendor people for making us do this, but I think it's much more confidence-inspiring to get a regular screwdriver then, put it in here like this, where you can hold tight, doesn't matter the strings are moving around. Now I'm going to turn and put some, uh, put some force into it, if you like, and I'm going to check it, and that's still not um it's not backbone or anything 
so we should be somewhere close now what I hate most I guess about this system is as you can see it's a pure guess right and there's no way around that there's nothing you can do to hope other than hope to get this in the right or get the adjustment right and it is absolutely a give it a go suck it and see so here we go now it's not the end of the world look you can see that all I have to do is you know, bit by bit replace the screws and, and if it's not right we'll do it again um, but I have to do a, t a tuning up in between and so oh my thumb so on and so forth so you can see why guitar techs think it's a pain now also while you're here if you're interested I'm sure you are uh, if you have poor alignment which you can't really tell with the capo one but let's say you take the capo off and you do a little bit of a little bit more tightening on this low E so you can got a straight line and the high E and if you're looking at it you won't be able to see it very well but I'm looking at it and I'm saying that's a bit of a uh, a bit too much in one way you can do a little bit of a a push and um, this one's a bit too and that's just about right so you can you can just move the neck side to side very slightly I quite like where it is now but do it while you've got the uh, thing out of place truth is if it's if the adjustment was wrong I'm gonna need to do it again anyway so there's no real way around it so let's call it call it fair for now um, yeah that'll do all right the truth is on the nut there's probably a little bit more sorry on the nut side there's a bit more extra room on that side compared to the, the treble side but anyway so now I have to tune up again. Let's see what you can see. Tune up again. Um, dead that string so now we've got tightened up under load now the time is to check the relief and see if that made any difference at all so again capo the first string first fret um, lift it up <coughs> have a check that's less but it's still not totally no okay that's better let's leave it there for now <coughs> I'd be happy with that reduced relief in it um, that's still too low so so the next thing we're going to do is going to bring the action down here <coughs> um, to roughly where we want so we said a 175 and a 1.5 with a spread across now so the first thing we do is we take this one down to the 175 mark of course this has got the American <coughs> American thingy the very thin thingy um, so, oh my thumb. <laughs> and take this down. Click. That was interesting. Take that down to what did we say? One point <coughs> one point seven five. So we've got one point five. That's nearly two. That's actually just about on. Fret slap come back to that so 1.75 again so 1.5 1.7 that's pretty good this one's now too low about 1.6 here well, that's about right actually uh, 1.5 just on just on the mark slightly slightly too high yeah. 
too high. Too low. <gasps> so the sort of distances or the you know, measurements we're talking here are very, very small. Um, so what you find is if you really can't get it to the action you want and get all the things playing, what you can do at this, you'd be amazed how the tiniest lift of the action here, while it sounds like a concession, actually the, the merest lift at that stage can clear a, a choking, which is, which is going to be helpful. So, oh, right. so we've raised and lowered some things, so it's out of tune. Okay, so now we've got the action, approximate action that we want. We've got nearly the first row action we've won, probably a little too low on one of them or two of them. And we've got the neck relief that's just about right for this guitar. And we've got the, pre the tension on right. So now what we're listening for is how it plays. Now what you start to hear on the wound strings is a little of what I call fret slap. That's that little buzz that accompanies a series of notes, sometimes half the neck even more. And then on the E, quite a bit down there. Whoops, falling off. Actually, most of the way there. So, and that actually doesn't look too low because of the combination of relief and the action. That isn't actually the lowest action ever. But, so we've got, oh, that next thing, that's the individual notes. And of course, the next thing is, do we get notes bending? So the first thing to do is make sure nothing's hitting any pickup poles. So you can hear everything. Everything around here. Let's call it 12 to 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 12 to 17 are all choking out on bends. So we want those notes. We don't have a strat. A strat? You don't have a stratocaster without those notes. Now the bees also will bend out too. And the problem with bees is that they're, if you think about that cross section, of the radius again, as you push the E's, they're going up the hill to the top of the hill, which is the G point or G track. Then the B goes up the hill to the G track center, but it doesn't bend quite as much in tone. And then it chokes out as you go over, which isn't the worst thing in the world. But if you could get a little bit more than that out of it, it'd be good. Then obviously the G um, is bending kind of into, or if you like, a better area by bending downhill. Um, because bending downhill will actually create more room. So we've got some choke outs here, and that's the target that I want you and me to look out for as we use the fret leveling, right? It's the, it's, that's the real achievement in this. The notes are pretty good. There's what I would call some fret slap down here on the A, fret slap all the way along the E, um, which aren't terrible, which isn't terrible, but it's there. 
um, which you can alleviate or remove. And then, of course, 12 up upwards, we're choking out on the, in the G track. And if we can free that up, <coughs> we've made this neck work great with the target action of 1.75 down to 1.5. The relief we've set as low as we can. Um, but the next thing I'm going to do before I get into any more of this, we don't even get started here. The next thing to do is to take care of the nut. Now, I've got a replacement nut with the fingers crossed. It would be absolutely wonderful if we can remove this nut and discover that the new one is pretty much a drop in. Well, we won't discover it because, well, we don't know yet whether it's a flat or a curved bottom. And some guitars surprise you and they don't have a flat and they have a curve and some just surprise you when you expect a vintage curve you get a flat one so the tusk one i buy has it can be used uh, either way it has a little leg in the middle it's a curved bottom one but it has a little central leg that allows you to use it as a flat on a flat bottomed shelf is the word i'm looking for um now, I think what I'm going to do on this, and I get catch myself out with this sometimes, I think I can just slack the strings off and do it. I think for the sake of getting this, making this easy for myself, let's get the strings off. They're not that hard to put back on, really, when all's said and done. And having them out of the way while we do the work on the nut is a much better way to go about it. Because then you don't worry about, I don't know, getting things stuck in the way. So we just flop them out of the way of this there's something caught under there flop them out of the way now the important thing about this is we're going to remove this nut to replace it with the replacement the first thing i want to do even though i'm pretty certain of it i want to just double check the radius with my gauge and that is pretty close to 7.25 it's actually it's actually almost if the, depends on whether this is true or not uh, it, you could argue that it's actually got, well, it is a 7.25, but it's got rolled edges, which add a little bit of a, a roll curve on there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to prepare this old nut to be removed. Now, when things go well, this nut will come off um, without a big struggle. In the worst possible cases, I have to saw it off, and people get very freaked out about it, because I use a Dremel, and it's if you're going to have to saw it off, there's no option but to saw it off, then you might as well use a Dremel or it won't be any less or more damage to anything. The, the, the worry people have is that you, when you saw a nut off, you can go down into the floor of the slot. Well, of course you can, but you're going to, there's a chance you'll do that with any kind of saw you use, just the act of sawing full stop. So if you're going to saw neither, no method is going to save you from the risk of doing that so you might as well um, just do whatever works best for you and in my case i prefer to use a uh, i prefer to use a the dremel cutting disc because i can see what i'm doing with it i can control it very well and it all goes great but i would love for this nut to now come out uh, with a little bit of gentle tapping, um, which I'm sure it will. So I'm going to supporting the guitar. It's on, if you can see, but it's under my under my arm here. Um, so I've got it at all times. There's no there's no chance of it falling off anywhere. Always got a grip, um, and I've got it in the um, supported in the neck supporty thing. And I'm going to give it a little tap, and that's very nice to see that it's uh, it's what's the word collaborating with us now in here we've got what I think is a flat bottomed slot it's interesting because I was just doing or is it or is it no you know what it isn't it's a r it's hard to tell some days it's a okie dokie no it's a it's a curved slot. It's really difficult to see. Um, it's, I don't know if we've even got some light, light enough to show us what I do in. Let's have some light. Extra, extra, extra. There's the light, there's the light, there's the light. 
power up the Frankenstein place. Yeah, that, see that's got to be, that has got to be round. I've chopped my fingers off, I carry on like that. Yeah, that's rounded. Just difficult to see in any light, I suppose. Okay, we are rounded, baby. So, um, that means we will take this out of its container. So there's a couple of things you need to know at this point, and that is the width, exact width of the one you took out, um, which we'll use our micro thingy for, digital caliper. So we want to know the exact width of this, because we'll use that as a target for the new one. We've got 3.2, I will call that. We'll always make a note so we don't forget. 3.2 and then we'll check our new one which will be a bit more 3.26 actually you know what this is almost a drop in width wise uh, yeah a couple of dusts with the sandpaper that'll be fine now what we have to do is get rid of this little little leg and that's actually not as easy as it looks but we'll use the dremel mm, thing for it which is ready to go and it's just a matter of bringing this up to the thing, supporting it somewhere like that, and then just gently using it to take down the, the little foot. And obviously you don't want to go too far down, but we want to take it back to flush. That's close enough. And so we can just examine it close up and see if we've got any, if there's any stick up here. And if there is, what we'll use, just a piece of 240 grit, like that. And we'll just make a little handheld piece, leg suit. And I'm just going to run it in there. Not easy to hold this, but that's, uh, that's pretty close anyway. A little bit more. Now the thing, what we, thing, what we don't know just yet is whether this is the right overall height, and we may have to do some reduction on the overall dimensions of this. So the first thing I'm going to do is while we're on the roll, I'm going to get the a leveling block, and I'm just going to very carefully flatten down this front flat face, flat face, and I'm going to. Just remove enough so I can comfortably go in. Now the art of getting this the right size is, is a time honoured, time trained, you know, learned over over time. Um, and you don't want it so tight you can't get it out, but you don't want it so loose that it will lean forward. And that's the biggest worry. Sometimes you'll get you think you've got a nut ready to go, but it, it'll actually be just loose enough to tilt forward and you totally do not want that right that's sitting straight in on that edge sitting straight that was as much as I want to adjust that one but we have the next question now which is it's actually slightly wide it needs a little bit of taking down but we check for the height here and it's not very scientific this but it's still too high um, so we're going to have to do some adjusting um, that we can sort of we can get a, a gauge where has my thing gone? I've lost it. It's right there. We can get a sort of sense with uh, this. So, for example, in the... Hmm, actually, we can't really fit that. Why is... This is almost like it's back to front. How oh, weird. So on the base side, we know we need... We need three mils between the bottom of the slot and the... Uh, and the thing, what's the thing I'm looking at? The base of the thing. And so what I can see straight away here is it's too, it's, um, it's too much. Too much, man. So three mils gives about a millimeter to take off this side. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to chance it. So what I'll do is I'll go back to my drawing board and with a piece of this, do that. So what we're going to do, I always like to do, is I'm going to draw the nut there first. 
thought it didn't like that. And I'm going to go there's the notch for the one high E and notch for the low E. And there's going to be a measurement we can take there and a measurement we can take there. Now, if you remember, they were pretty good on the other one. The strings were almost right, except they were a tiny bit low. So if we measure, first of all, uh, we can't really fit the thing in the... In the we can't get the thing into the bottom of the hole on the high E because it's too narrow. But we've got 3.6 as closely measured on that slot there as possible. This one's wider, so we can go further into that one. On the base one, it says between that and the bottom, we've got uh, 3.0. So 3.6 and 3.0. Now, if we're going to aim to copy this, um, we want to put, I think, let's start by putting 0.2 on and we'll call this 3.8 and 3.2. Well, that too is just to lift it up a tiny bit so we've got a little bit of leeway and we don't want to end up with it exactly the same as before because that would just make the thing again low on the D which I've low on the D which I've already done. So let's imagine our target action is 3.8 um, on that side. Now what I've actually got is 3.93 on the treble side and in the base one 3.7 so I've got 3.7 um, and 3. Point. it's funny on the treble side I didn't think that was anywhere near close oh we'll call it four we've got four um, and what we so we've got to lose 0 0.2 at least and maybe a bit more and here we've got to lose the 0.5 on the base side. So that's a, an uneven uh, reduction, which is a little bit more challenging on a, a thing with a base, a thingy base. Now, one way around this, if you really can't sand it from the bottom up, if the thing is just, if it was a flat bottom one, we could make the adjustments uh, by putting more emphasis on sanding this side. But the problem is that when it's a... Um, when it's a uh, curved one, we've only got one or two options for accurately sanding it back from the bottom upwards. Um, and that's to use a, a little device that um, Bob uh, made for me, which I'll get out in a minute. But let's just, I'm just going to hoik out for the time being. Let's get up a string and load a two, the two E's just so we've got something to work to. So I'm not really going to put too much pressure on it. I just want to get a sense of with the action set how we want it, what we've got over the top or how much more we've got than we need. And so we'll do the same with the low E. We can untangle that for the minute. So a lot of this I often do offline. So I'm deliberately sort of doing all this workings out online this time. Online? No, on camera. You know what I mean. A lot of it I usually do off camera because it's sort of boring figuring out work. But here we we'll do it on camera. So another way to do it, if we're not sure, if that did looked a little bit hard to get your head around, another way to do this is to is to check the action when the strings are sitting in the slot. So I'm, I'm going to keep my granddad glasses on for a minute. Um, so uh, in order to do this, I'm going to now check with the feeler gauges. And I think this is probably about one mil. So 795, 795.95, yep. Now what I'm hoping is, I've miscalculated, and I'm hoping that it will be the same amount to come down either side, in which case we've got a better chance of doing it. Uh, 95, 115. I'd say that's 115, that's pretty close. So let's just go 1.15, and we want 0 0.3. 
0.3 really so the target is going to tell us quite a lot of reduction let's look on the base side same yeah no, actually I think I miscalculated so it's about the same over on both sides 0.3 which is good it means that we've got the same reduction so that thing about doing more or less on one side I don't know why that's probably not the most effective way by measuring the actual um, nut because uh, this is in place in situ and and I think we take this one's word for it so uh, where's my thing I've got a headache do you know that um, so if I get my calculator out, although it should be a simple calculation, but I'll still do the calculator. So I have 1.15 minus 0.3, and that means I've got to take away 0.85 on both sides. 0.85 on both sides. Now, this is where we will go back to measuring the nut. Um, so I'll point this out. I'll rub off my initial calculations, and we'll go back now to measuring We'll remeasure our actual nut and we'll go measured now at the high E slot we've got 3.9 3.9 so the actual one is 3.9 and on the base side it's going to be less because this thing the blade goes further in or the caliper blade goes further in 3.65 we'll just call it 3.6 right now we're going to remove 0.85 from both to get it to the conservative height. Is that going to be the conservative? No, that's not. That's going to be spot on. Okay, so the spot on is that, and we're going to get the red one, we're going to get the calculator again, and we're going to go, in this case, 3.9. That should be very simple, minus 0.85 is 3.05. So our target for this one equals 3.05. I know you can't see that on the board, you're just watching me sort of draw it really. Um, and the other one is 3.6 minus 0.85 is 2.75 is my target down there. Now this is much easier to chase whilst sanding than uh, it is. So we know it's nearly a millimetre, which is quite a lot to do. Um, let's change these glasses. It's starting to get warm in here. Um, so yes, so we've got. So this is this is a, a lot of where the time goes to get this right. I could make it simpler by cutting down into the uh, nut with the with the nut files, right? But you see, I don't know how well you can see it, but if you look closely at this nut, you will see. You will see. Look at those. Beauty, not my fingers, look at my crappy fingers, crappy fingers, chewed fingers, but anyway, you'll see the factory molded slots on this. I'm trying to preserve those so they don't have to dig into them with a uh, nut file. That's my aim. I want to use that the smoothness of those. Um, but it's obviously going to take a long time because now what we've got to do is take 0.85 of a mil. Um, which is a specific amount of stuff. I've got to take it off this here. That's not really good because I can't actually see anything. But there's a sort of mark on there which gives me an idea of how much that is. Um, I probably... Does it work with this? I tried to do it before with a bit of foil on the nut. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. So if we put a bit of foil on, I'm just trying this out. We got that thing. I've got the thing set to 0.75, just to not to just to sort of get a little bit of hold back. So there's the thing. What we can do here is around there, cut around that to make it give us a start point, and then with the thing here, we could, it's sort of hard to make it, to hold it in any way, but let's run it down here like so, <coughs> damn it, so that, if I can get this little bit off, 
we may have a good sort of mark for our sanding, but it's actually it's actually looking quite quite difficult to see. I'm sort of eyeballing it now a little bit. Ugh. What those birds are fighting about? Something. Right. Well, this is this is sort of working, and it's that in that it's giving me a a rough, near idea of how much I've got to remove. Crows or magpies? I can't tell. I think it's crows. Right. Well, this is this isn't the the mark. If you if you get what I mean, this is just a, a visual guide. So I'm just taking an extra bit of time to give myself something to reference as I'm doing it. And really, what we don't want is anything on top of here. So just to Give us a chance not to have anything on there. I'm going to cut off the top bit so it doesn't thicken up the measurement when we come to measure it. So all I've got, hopefully, in a minute... Oh, God. My fingers. In a minute, all I want is the bottom section on. Get there. Yeah, yeah. I don't want anything to interfere with the measurement because this thing about getting it to the right first row action from bottom up is very precise. Um, and you can see in many ways it's why I, I really did like, and I probably maybe will do again, I don't know. Uh, my tendency was to go towards the uh, using adjustable nuts, or making adjustable nuts even on for strats. Uh, like this, and um, I stopped doing them recently because I don't know. It just I don't know if it felt. I oh, sorry, you didn't see any of that. That was the worst bit of filming. Sorry, that will all have had to have been overhead shot. Oh. Right, there's my marker. Now I know I can see roughly how much I've got to. It's not pretty accurate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my seven two five nine point five seven two five thingy, and I can. Use a little, a little simple two five. This is the uh, Bob Sirtle device. So what I can use this for is I can stick the nut in here. Uh, it's got the same radius. I need a bit more room. Stick the nut in here. Squeeze it in. Now this doesn't really allow. This doesn't stop me from. Um, doesn't kind of let me get a flush cut because you'd have to sand away the uh, plastic as well, which I don't really think will make the thing last very long. But what I can do is I can I can basically hold the um, the thing in there pretty tightly. Um, now these things are set. That's a 7.25 radius. So what I'm going to do is I know I've got as much to get rid of as down to that mark. So I can begin by holding this block fairly robustly, pushing as sort of central as I can. And the idea would be using this to get down to close to the, um, the, the line I put on here. And it won't be very massively quick. So it'll probably take a little bit of, a little bit more working it. So I'm doing it kind of held like this so I get a fairly firm grip and I can try to control the levelness of the sand because we want the we want the um, the bottom of this nut slot the uh, nut to be at right angles to the top now what I can't really see is how anywhere near close to the mark I am let's say I don't know and I can't see it what we do is undo this and we'll get the measurement out and we know what we're looking for in both cases so we're looking at we're looking for 305 <coughs> on the troubled side and we're looking for 
275 on the base side. So what have we got here? We've got 38. Uh, so it's come down a little bit. Wow. Um, and down here we've got 35. So we've still got tons to go. All right, so we can... Um, I mean, we could, if we were feeling brave, for example, we could get the thing out here and we could take a little bit of bulk off and you'd have to be very brave to do this. As I am now demonstrating. So I've <laughs> taken a big risk in bump starting the <laughs> Uh, the, the sanding thing. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this up by hand just to get it down to the curve, that's the radius curve, but also so I'm just controlling it with the pressure I'm putting on it by hand and it's, uh, it's harder to hold um, but it, it means I can stop more often and um, do the measurement. So on the base side, we've got, we're looking for 275, and this is three, currently 32, which has come down. And then on the treble side, we're looking for we're looking for 305, and we're at 350, so it's coming down. So I will now put it back in here for a bit longer. I'm not going to do the Dremel again at this point. That was that was risky enough. Mm. Okay, check that, check that. I mean you could run it straight down flat to this, but you would have to, you, there's no way you would know when you were at the correct, when the thing was sticking up the right amount to allow you to run flat. In other words, you'd have to have the only the exact amount you need to take off sticking up, and there's no way you could measure that and get the exact right amount sticking up. It would be impossible. Okay, so again, every time I do this, I remember to center that, or sorry, zero that, not center it, zero that We're on the treble side. I'm going to just locate on the slot, and we're going 3.5, and we're going. 3.35. So we're coming down and it's just going to take some more. 3.5, 3.35. That's half a mil. Go on, let's, let's just do a tiny bit more dremeling. About half a mil we can afford to. Definitely the last time I'm going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in here. I'll just square it off to be sure. As close as we can get. And then we'll do a measure. Of course, if it goes over, then we have to get another one and start again. Or I get tempted to say, to hell with the factory molded slots. I rather fancy doing it all with the files, which will be a million times quicker. But there we are. Okay, so now I'm just aim here now is just to level this off, or flatten this off, square it off I should say, it's a better way of putting it. Which is probably about there. So it's a, tr it is a tricky thing radiusing a nut to go into a radius slot. There's no doubt about that. It's not easy. Okay, it's zeroed. And we're at the locating on the first one. We're down at 3.2. That's pretty good. We're down at 3.12. So I'm going to take this copper stuff off now because it doesn't have any more purpose. And I'm going to we'll just carry on sanding this. Now, the worst comes to the worst. If 
I put this on and we find that it's all brilliant except for, let's say one of them, the slot is by definition or for some reason just slightly off, then um, we may always have the reserve the option to tweak it with the, um, the files if it's absolutely necessary. If one's deeper than all the others then you won't get there by taking the whole nut down. You have to amend one on its own separate from the rest. So kind of hope that isn't the case but we always sort of stand by to be able to do that if we have to. Okay so as, as you can see I'm sort of aware now of the amounts we've got left to do so I'm just now kind of trying to get it down to there in a fairly controlled sort of way. The main thing is keeping that um, shape underneath. And again, annoyingly, taking it off every two seconds to uh, check it. So that's now come down quite a long way from what it was before. Um, let's try the treble side. 3.2 still, base side, 3.10. So we're coming down. Now another way you can do it is, if I'm thinking it's not going quick enough, we can get the whole thing on there like so and push down to borrow the radius if you like and move a bit more in one go. So we're just sort of doing a bit more heavy work really. Um, and then once we've done that to make sure, bring it round and drag it. It's looking good. Check again. So zero. This doesn't seem to be moving. 3.25. 3.10. So 3.25 is not moving down this end, the treble end, so I'm going to give it some more push on this end and do a check. Wow, doesn't seem to want to move. So the treble end is this way up. I'll take a bit more time on that one. So we had, um, yeah, yesterday, Claire went into town with the car, taking, taking Thomas, her son, in to get his eyes done. And um, uh, when they were in there, the uh, battery had failed to charge or drained during the time we were they were in town. So she couldn't get out. Anyway, somebody very kindly uh, stopped with other, we had jump leads but they weren't very long, so a kind Tavistock Samaritan <laughs> stopped to help and um, to, to Claire's horror he blew a fuse on his car in the process of starting ours and so I think they had to be kind of sat there waiting for the uh, their, their RAC or AA to come and rescue them uh, after having stopped so kindly to help for, help us out, so it felt terrible. Okay, 3.05, we're on the treble side, spot on. We're a little tall on the bass side. Um, let's do a, a tiny bit more push on the bass side now, like this. And then just kind of keep the focus on the bass side as much as possible, but we don't obviously want it to, we still want it to sit nicely. We're very nearly there. Base side 280, 295, we're 0.2 above really. We're um, a tiny bit above on the <laughs> trouble side, which is close. I'm just going to do it a little bit of dragging by hand to get the shape right. And then um, 
I'm putting a bit of extra weight on the base side as we do it. Now, the thing to do at this point in time is to re-insert uh, re, uh, it and check it for height. Ah, it's got some sticky glue on it. That's why it's not sitting in there. Um, now, I'm going to wipe the glue off instead of with a solvent instead of sanding it because I don't really want to take down any more width off the uh, thing. So better to just clean it, keep that snug fit that we had before. Come on, thank you. Thank you so much. Right, so let's drop that in there now. Now it's a tiny bit uh, thicker, and the reason that is is because as we sometimes as we reduce the height of the nut, we find that the top part of it can be a little bit thicker. So we, it's not always a perfect thing. So it can be a little thicker than we thought it was. So just a tiny adjustment there will help. And then we go over the top there, over the top there, and we tighten up there, tighten up there. It's looking good. Now, it's really precise business now, is we, we're under good pressure. Let's see what the height is now. I think we're probably about 0.4 on this one. Maybe, no, we're not. Yes, we are. Point four. Point four on that one. So we are the faintest whiff over the amount I'd want. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm literally now, literally, I'm just going to hold on to this and hand sand it a, a little more, which could all I know take forever or might be quickish <laughs> but I think now we're at that place it would be better to push these into position it's very important that you've got it right the way down in the slot if it's floating above in any way shape or form it'll totally uh, mess up your calculations down under that so we're probably about three now spot on point three I'm going to stop there now the only thing I've got to do is we've got a little bit of overhang that we need to take off and uh, I would say it's probably a tiny bit off each end I'll assume it's a bit off each end So I'm going to take it down like this by hand. It's tr quite tricky to keep it uh, nice and level. And it, again, it, it's just guesswork at this point. And we've got a bit of rounding off to do because it gets a bit sharp otherwise. And there's this end here. So I keep this vertical. Take a little bit off this end too. Um, round it off all the surfaces really. That's what you want to be able to do is take off the burrs and just put a little bit of a, a round off on every possible sharp corner because we don't really we really don't want to feel it. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to round off this this little top edge here which won't do any harm to the slot it'll just make it more comfortable. There's no, there's no need for this um, to be a sharp uh, line. A little bit off the edge, a little bit off the edge, round it off, round it off. I saw an amazing thing on YouTube yesterday, my favourite channel, um, and it was a it was a Scottish guy uh, taking a tour or taking us round, touring round uh, the Faroes, or one island on the Faroes, and a 
kind of read about it in books a long, long, long time ago. Um, but I've never really um, been there or seen there much. And uh, wow, it was incredible. That's too far to one side now. Uh, tiny bit back in. Now, it wants to be, does it want to be there? That's its spot on the middle. Okay, let me just check something. Yeah, that's a direct, direct comparison side to side. Okay, so there we have it. Now, after all of that, that's taken a hell of a long time. It's an hour and a quarter uh, just to get the nut done on this. Now, we're ready to do the fret leveling and this is where the fun begins but when once we've done the nut well first of all doing the analysis of the guitar the overview getting a sense of what's right and wrong with it followed by getting the nut right which is so important um, to have a good quality tusk nut fitting snugly not leaning anywhere and doing the great job we want it to do which is get the perfect first fret action and having no friction getting that where we want it is a it's absolutely spot on that's what we're that's half of the battle done the rest of it now becomes leveling the frets um, and once we've leveled the frets in a in a way the uh, complex or precision stuff is done and now what i mean by that is after that it's really um, it's only in bird commas a matter of polishing things out um, and finishing so finishing things off and the beauty about the setup part is that it will all return as soon as you reload it with strings it'll come back to the setup and levelness uh, that we had while we were doing the fret leveling because this method unlike any other method levels the frets i level the frets with the neck under load and curved or relieved we should say and the great thing about that is that um, I try to explain it in lots of different ways and there are lots of things to say about this method which which um, take quite a while to kind of go through but the important thing to say about it is that this method first of all is the only method uh, out there this essential method doing it with the strings on and the neck under loading is the only way you're going to level the frets with the effects of compression in already at play in the neck and the important thing about that is that when the neck is loaded um, it changes shape slightly from when it was flat and flat on the bench so if you level the frets with the neck flat and un not under load lying flat on the bench you can get a level set of frets however they change that all changes when you put it under tension again because the longitudinal forces they, ca they cause the neck to, to curve, which is the relief, that's fine. But the m important bit is that it causes the neck to um, bunch up a little bit. Um, so it changes shape in that way. And when it bunches, it puts the frets in different relationship to each other. So the thing that was 100% level on the bench actually isn't anymore when it's strung up and in the normal plane configuration. And that I used to think when I started doing this sort of first kind of work this method I thought that actually this method that I use kind of turned out to probably be about five percent more accurate than the other um, but I've since thought or well, the experiences recently make me think it's more like 10 15 percent Right, what I'm going to do now is let's get on and do the leveling and after that I'm going to take a break, recharge some batteries and stuff and we'll come back. I'll do, I will do the um, polishing and everything, the polishing and recrowning, oh, I'll do the recrowning 
in a minute but I'll do the polishing part which takes a while do that off camera so I can get a break and recharge and make sure I have the things going to get to the end of this otherwise we could be in running out of memory or running out of uh, battery mode which is a pain so I'm not really going to try and go into too much detail about this I'm just going to get this method on the run on the go <coughs> in a bit and we're going to just get this thing leveled and the important bit will be as we get across into the G track um, and when we try and clean up those free up those chokes and we're looking from 12 to 17 if you remember um, that's what we've got to rescue and then we've also got to get rid of the uh, fret slap um, which I'll, again, I won't go into the definitions of that, but that kind of accompanying buzz at the um, the accompanying buzz uh, on the wound strings. Now that little clunky noise is just the edge of this clunking on the the frets because obviously the thing is longer. I could potentially use the bass one. I haven't really tried the bass one on a, a guitar. I've only used it on basses. It's too. It doesn't reach all the way on the bass either. But um, it, I still kind of stuck with this one. It's been more comfortable. I guess what I'm saying is I've never actually tried the other one. So it might, might be worth doing at some point. Um, okay, so. Ah, <laughs> right. Now this is interesting. Oh God, everything's interesting. You remember 12 to 17 choked out? Or round about there. Look what we've got. We've got cut, cut, cut. High spot here. But they're all cutting, so we call them level, if you like. The ones that cut more, we'll call them high. And then suddenly, look at this, 10, 11, sorry, 10 to 19 drops off into a hole where nothing is being cut. So you've, got a, you've got a, actually got a dip there, which covers all of those frets, which is why all of those are choking out. Because as you're bending, uh, the, you're, when you fret them and bend them, you're starting in a ditch, and you're trying to bend up to the top, and the the fact that it's in a ditch um, means, um, let's see, when you bend it, you're out of the ditch. That's not so bad, but you can you can see that there is definitely a ditch there. Look how much is coming off there relative to that. None. So there's a complete drop off in this neck. Now, I, I did this yesterday with um, with George's guitar, and what I did is kind of when I saw it, I put my I sort of held it up there and looked down the neck. The C and George's guitar on the Epiphone, I really could see it. Now this doesn't show up so much vis visually, but the bar or the beam, the leveling beam, the banana, is telling us that this has got a low spot. Um, and it's quite a long one. Now the, qu the issue is we don't have to bottom it all out. What we have to do between the G track and the E track, we have just to get it to a point where the notes we want will play. And that's a hard thing to do. So first of all, I want to know these notes play. So the dip here is causing a little bit of a choke here because these are high or back up to normal. And up at about 18, 17, 18, we're, in a, we're still in that dip, which is making those just zizz a tiny bit. But actually, there's nothing too bad to worry about. For, our, for good luck, I'm going to do a tiny bit more of a level uh, in there at this end and I'm just going to run it over and co sort of concentrate on this uh, ditch at the end and see if there's anything about it that we can sort of get a little closer to bottoming out but like I said it's probably not it's not absolutely vital we do we're just beginning to touch the tops of a couple of them but they're still absolutely definitely sort of 11 to 15 ish there's a there's definitely a trench and, and to, to eke out those strings there, we're having to take 19 and 20 down a little bit too. So it kind of bears, bears out what, what we knew from uh, playing it. So now I'm going to do the B track with the same calibration as the E, as is customary to do. Um, and in a way, the B track is probably less critical, but I'm going to kind of treat it with the same in the same way. Um, I don't know why that's it's clunking today. Is that because it's slightly, that's slightly twisted, isn't it? That's why. That's why. Let's take that twist off it. 
Now I've got to recalibrate. I just had the end cap just twisted around slightly the wrong way. So when uncertain about the calibration, having twisted that now, I'm going to recalibrate. If I can find the brass dome nut. So it's only a matter of time, like everything, just go back and take the time to do it. That's a bit over curved now. That's good. Right, so we'll do the B as such. Okay, and now the critical one, of course, will be the G. And this is where we'll be. It's still, still touching that one. I am definitely. No, that's right. Okay. Hmm. I should probably take that little piece off the end and. It's only when it just clatters over the final fret, but again, it's no, it doesn't mark it or anything, it's just a noise. So, again, just a, a sort of run over, and what have I got? Well, I've definitely got high frets here. Good, average, all the same. High, uh, low, high. That's, that's just a huge, huge ditch. <laughs> so... Okay, that's playing. Now I'm not going to worry about the ditch. The unevenness of the frets below the level of the action you're aiming for. It doesn't matter if it's got tons of unevenness. We don't really care if it's got some in there. We only care about what gets in the way of the, fret, uh, the strings when at the action we've set. Um, so the good thing about this method is you only work to the action. You don't kind of go after an all-over arbitrary absolute levelness which is what the other method does with the fret rockers and the level of the flat neck but this one we we can happily leave some blackened out frets because they'll be below the um, as long as they're below or they don't create effect to the action we've chosen now here is the G track and the G track is going to be critical now to um, getting those bends because it's in the G track that the bends typically choke out and so this point here where there's a the if you like the um the valley in the g track is going to be significant it's going to have an effect of course the thing about low frets is that they um, they dictate what you can do on the neck more than the high frets do because a single high fret can be taken down quite easily See, we're getting through it. Notice how that's playing where it wasn't before. It was choking out completely. So we've got the notes playing because of that work on the G track, but it's only just, which is fine. You know, we can only get what we can get. If I do a little bit more, and now comes the sort of um, judgment call bit where I have to kind of keep track of this and think to myself, where, when have I reached a point that I don't want to do any more uh, leveling? You know, and how do I assess that point? And that again comes with uh, a lot of experience. But this is a a bit like um, George's Epiphone. This is this this guitar is also got quite a an interesting topography. Now, of course, a lot of this is all just talk, right? So when by the time we get this back done, recrowned, and polished out. Tim will never know the difference. Okay, let's just let me get this down. We're on 12, so we're in the ditch. And that's just about choking out here on the, no, the next fret. So we're in a ditch, and we can't really do anything about that until we bottom that out a little bit. So it's, uh, okay, one, I'm going to do one, at this point, I'm going to just do this one more run in the G track and after that I'm going to move on um, and see where I go and come back and reconsider. So 
kind of looking to the, the thing about the I, knew, I should finish my sentences sometimes but the thing about the um, the high frets as I said is the individual high fret is easy to take down to the level of all the other frets the um, a individual low fret is difficult because you have to bottom out the frets around it and bring them into line with the, the, the low fret. So it costs you more in metal if you've got a low fret than if you've got a single high one. Because the low one you have to, you have to level or you have to, uh, what would the word be? Equalize the difference between the two, uh, the, you know, the bottom of the low ones and the ones either side. It's quite tricky. So now we're on to the D track and I'm going to, this one hasn't got any problems of its own so I'm just going to kind of keep this one in line with the other ones um, and, it will, and it, you know at the same time just keep an eye on what it's telling me if anything about the uh, state of the, the frets on this part of the neck radius but I have a feeling that's going to be enough for this D. Um, it's quite a bit of leveling on some of these frets which is a I have to say is an indicator of not a great neck so all the individual notes play fine yeah. we may never get the total best out of this the sort of 12 13th 14th in the middle of the ditch is its lowest point and it's it's struggling to get the full bends out of it but I'm not gonna hack it anymore I think I'm gonna leave it there and I think at this point my judgment call will be once I've recrowned it and everything if I really can't get those bends out of it after the polishing and so on I will take the action up a tiny fraction because I'd rather that than uh, you know, take away more metal chasing something that we can't really have. And, it, and the limitation on this, as I've explained, is the is basically the the fact that this neck has a, a valley at that point, um, one that isn't particularly visible to the eye, but it's certainly picking it up in terms of the the fret metal. And of course, it, the fact that it's true is confirmed by the, uh, the performance of the of the notes within that. Uh, you know, when we try and play them, the bends get choked out at a certain point. Um, so it's really, it's really interesting how sometimes you think, oh, maybe this beam isn't flat. Maybe it's that's the problem. I mean, after all, this this Fender expensive Fender signature guitar, surely the they must have got a flat neck, or a, it must be curved in a very even fashion. It must be the guy's leveling technique that's wrong. And actually, this thing, what I'm the reason I'm confident with this is that it reconfirms both directions. tiny bit of fret slap around the 10, 11, 12 mark. So I'm going to again put this back here and I'm going to concentrate, inverted commas, on the 10, 11, 12 mark to just try and even that area out a little bit so we clean up that little bit of dragging fret slap which is this accompanying buzz. It's not caused by a single uneven fret, it's actually caused by a sort of a high spot which we know exists there. Um, but it, once we've done that, it gets it, limits it, and reduces it. Okay, so the final one now is the low E, which had the most of the slap associated with it, um, which is a kind of low or a, a accompanying rattle all the way, almost all the way up the neck. And again, that seems to be that it it's kind of not enough. It's just slightly not enough room for the frets to move given the action chosen and given the amount of relief chosen but it and the, of course the wound thick string does have to move more so my practice at this point is to impose inverted commas the uh, curve of this tool into this overall neck so that whatever the undulating topography of the neck is trying to do this tool will sort of impose its own curve into that 
group of frets and then what it does obviously it has to take a bit off the ends of the frets where it's making contact um, and then but it's it's quite it's used quite lightly so it isn't taking that much um, wow it's taking it all I'm happy right yeah like I said I'm going to stick to my guns and I'm going to stop the leveling there um, and I'm going to re look reconsider the action if at the final countdown it's not doing what I want uh, in respect of those full bends up here but still you heard that we got them whereas they weren't playing before so now they are um, this is extremely good these strings are coming off now get thrown away This nut actually is so well fitted, I don't think it needs gluing in. I like to not do it if it doesn't need it. Um, it just makes things a hell of a lot easier for anyone in the future who wants to make a, an adjustment or change it for another one or do whatever they want. Or if it breaks or cracks or something, then you can get it out without a lot of trouble. So really, my motto is only glue it if it needs it. And if it's snug enough, it shouldn't have to be glued. Right, so there's the, there's, after all of that, there's the complexity done, um, you know, with all it reveals along the way, uh, as I say. I don't mean, Tim, to suggest that for some reason. I think it's just a pure, weird, and lucky, unlucky thing that your guitars, both yours and George's guitars, have had the, I'd say, some of the oddest frets we've got so we've got a load of cutting there because these are high we can see we're barely beginning to touch those there because this clump was low these were high and these were median just a, just remarkable as my brother would say remarkable so uh, i'm going to next do the crowning before i go for a drink break and a bit of recharging um so the crowning now is going to just round off the squared flattened edges of these leveled frets. Um, that, we needed to make that nice and playable again, and also to sorry, also to return the frets to a nice arch shape instead of the um, instead of the uh, flattened bit we've got here. So, just as far as the the crowning, uh, recrowning goes. I just run the file over the fret to take away the edges and leave a black strip of marker pen along the top. And the idea is just to do it and leave the thinnest possible marker pen strip, which tells me I haven't lowered the overall fret, but I've uh, taken away the flattened edges. Um, I can also see here there's some fret wear that's almost taken away in this leveling but there's a tiny hint of one of the play grooves down here but I think that will disappear and certainly smooth out in the polishing sanding and polishing stage so having said these were all normal in my reckoning so I'm not really spending an undue amount of time on them you can see that there are a couple of passes a little bit of leaning of the um, crowning tool this one's taking a little bit longer but most of all they're still in the normal range now we're going to get some larger ones here that's probably going to suddenly take a little bit longer to do. Maybe a, more at one end or the other. Um, less in the middle. Okay, and then we're going to have some really higher ones at the end here. Let's see if I can zoom in towards the 12th fret. Okay, I'm just in view. Okay, this is, this is quite flat, or reasonably flat, compared to the others. So this is where we know we've taken off more metal, because we have to work a little bit harder to round it off again. There's still more than enough metal to do that, so there's never, we're never likely to be anywhere near uh, an unrecoverable thing. This one particularly now, and if you can see, where is it? The lighting might not be so good. Let's try and get you the best view lighting, maybe there. So this one, uh, it, you may be able to see how much uh, will work. There you go. Is that the one? Uh, 
See the thin lines there, the black, see how fat the line is on the, in the middle? If I just keep doing this, you'll see the silver line kind of encroaching and coming inwards towards the middle. See that? Yeah. So I have to kind of keep working that until that line is as thin as is possible for it to be. And then we can, we know we've got the closest thing we've got possible to a, an arch shape of this fret and we can move on to the next one. But you can see that, you can see from the dust and everything, that took longer than the others. And that's just a, a token of how, uh, how much um, leveling was required to get this more, more playable. And that, that's just because of the, uh, the shape of the neck. See, the problem is, um, when, you, when you're presented with the neck in its true loaded dynamic, in other words, with that compression at play, and the frets doing what they want to do when they're under load, um, you, you get this strange hilly configuration of a neck, and it's not doing what you you and the manufacturer would hope it's doing. It's not forming a nice even curve. It's actually creating a bunch of hills and valleys, um, which is what this leveling process throws up very quickly. And so when you're faced with that, of course you can't bend the wood. The wood is behaving the way an organic matter will behave under compression and load. So you've got no chance of curing that. You have to work with what it presents you because if, even if you, you know, even if you refretted, you'd still, the, the wood would still move in the same way and still place those frets in that strange hilly fashion because it's the wood that's hilly, not the frets. Anyway, um, so that you, all you really have to work with is the presented surface of the frets and that's what this method does really well is it tames that surface and so it allows the wood underneath to be uh, have no choice the wood the wood underneath remains buckled twisted hilly undulating whatever you want to call it but in doing what I do with the leveling process we've tamed the presenting frets which is the top surface of that hilly topography you get what I'm saying so and that's what's good about the frets is that we can sacrifice some of the material to tame off the uh, irregularity of the neck. But it's amazing how irregular the neck can be and how big the variation can be between guitars. And then again, when you think that it's wood, it's organic, it doesn't do, oops, it doesn't do anything you uh, tell it to do, really. It'll do its own thing. Um, so it's not surprising, really. And that's why when you get a carbon fiber guitar, I did set up on an emerald not too long ago. Uh, and that neck was, judging by the, what the fret banana told me, um, that neck was the most perfect curve of any neck on any guitar I've ever worked on. And so that's no coincidence that it's the only fiberglass neck that I'd ever uh, checked and you know not leveled exactly but you know checked out um, it was perfect and so that's clearly because it was made obviously because it was made of carbon fiber and when it bent in a relief curve which it un undoubtedly does because you need relief in it even if it's made of carbon fiber um, when it bent it bent in a uniform way which would have met or mirrored modeled the curve on the banana had I used it on there don't think I had to because it was perfect but um, you know had I needed to that neck would have modeled that curve or mirrored that curve perfectly well so we wouldn't have got that whole bunch of some high and some not cutting much and some hardly cutting at all it would have been consistent all the way through now these at the end here are significantly high and they have needed quite a lot of taming as well so that's why I'm spending more time on here, getting to the end, just about. I can, sorry, I'm turning the light down when in fact what I want to do is change the focus, no, the zoom. Anyway, so we're almost, almost there. And for all the people who get freaked out about the dust from frets, it is not magnetic or it is not attracted by magnets, okay? I'm not going to go into this again, but just take my word for it. I've done tests to quell the worries of anybody who goes, ah, look, you've got, you know, oh, this fret dust is going to stick to the pickups and cause your combustion engine to blow up. 
There is nothing magnetic at all about this fret dust. Proof, fact, not even going to argue with it about it. So there we go. Uh, so you know you don't have to cover up your pickups. You can clean them off just like anything else. Now, if I was using wire wool, yes, I would, because wire wool is ferrous and the little bits will stick to your pickups. But I'm not using wire wool. Right, there is the recrowned uh, neck. But what I'm going to do next is I'm going to clean off as much of the black pen as I can before I go into shut down quiet time, <laughs> drink time. So I'm just going to do my first bit to get rid of the black marker pen on the sides of the frets so that it's just not having to worry about it when I come to polish, get rid of the bulk of it right now. And you can see there's, you know, there's always some to come off and it's just a, a cosmetic thing which is nice. Um, and then the next bit off camera I will mask off the whole fretboard and, and then I will um, sand and polish out the frets using a, a prog progression of succession of grit papers from 50, uh, sorry, from 400 grit all the way through to 12,000 micromesh uh, grade, which is pretty fine. Okay, so that will be all off camera because I'm tired and need a break. Alrighty, so see you when all that's done and we'll be right near the end then and we'll rush on. But it's been a long time already, uh, coming up for nearly two hours. So see you in a bit. All right, we're back. <clears throat> we are back after the polishing out of all the frets, polishing of the body as well, give it a clean up. So sort of did a bit of polishing, get rid of some of the scratches here. Actually, they came up quite nicely, as you can see. Um, next stop, oh, I fitted the tusk string tree. Keep the old one for later. Um, frets all done. Look how dry that board is. Time to polish the board. No, oil the board. So we get the cloth and we do the oily boarding thing. Water boarding, oil boarding. Give it a drink. Well, give it some oil. Make it dark and slippery. Okay, so at this stage of the game, all the hard work is done, hurrah! And all we have left is to basically, um, yeah, this is definitely being squashed in the fretting process somewhere, that fingerboard. Anyway, yeah, what we've got left is to uh, fit the strings, stretch them out, intonate them, and then just set the tremolo to down only, and we're done. This has taken quite a long time, um, and I think a lot of it, well, a lot of it was taken up by the, the nut in this case because it was, it was quite a, a tricky one to get exactly right. A curved nut, curved base nut um, without using the nut files. That was my challenge. So, I mean, you know, I don't think anyone would care if I used the nut, nut files, but it's just like my personal deal that I want to have the best possible thing, uh, you know, tuning stability, the best possible freedom of movement of people, no, of strings through the nut. Um, and to get that, I do need to do the business with sizing the nut from the bottom up. And of course, that, that is what takes time. And it's what used to put me off uh, completely in the past from trying to do that. I just, I co it cost me too many uh, nuts, <laughs> you know, in the, in the olden days. I'd go through so many, I'd end up with loads of spare ones waiting to be reused some other time. But eventually sort of stuck at it and figured out a, a method, as you saw, with measuring and careful taking down of the size of the nut to get it all right and everywhere down to the right dimensions. And I seem to have got it pretty well these days. So, so you get the best of the factory slots and the right height over the first fret. Da -da! But it's tricky, that's for sure. Anyway, so uh, yes, I, I'm going to have to I'm going to get a new battery for the car on Saturday. So in the meantime, I'm going to have to hope that the battery has got enough left in it for now to get me going to get me home, which I'm sure it will. But it's um, yeah, fingers crossed, eh? I've had it before, it's uh, it's been not holding a charge too well for a long time, so I've been lucky to get as far as we got, I think. Um, but you can nurse it along if you keep avoid 
steadfastly avoid putting on the, the you know the screen blowers and you know the fog cleaners or whatever fog go away as you know what I mean um, but you don't want to be caught out in a rain in the winter not being able to run the blowers and so on so you're better off spending the money and getting a better battery three four uh, four five and six away throw those away so yeah the great thing about this now is all the precision stuff is done all that remains now is to get everything strung up again but take care of the uh, care of the yeah, take care of, I'm going to finish my sentence we're going to take care of the stretching and the intonation so with the tremolo I'm just going to take the pressure off the front of the plate here because it's a little bit tightened up on these so I'm just going to back them off to give the plate a chance to move more freely. Your screws, heads, really don't want to be touching this plate. If they're touching the plate, they're probably pressing it down at the front, which is absolutely not what you need. So you want that little bit of extra back off. It will do the job perfectly well, but you just back it off that tiny bit. And you should then get a, a freer movement out of it. Okay, that's everything. So let's get into the wiring up thing. Some people are not fans of these split post tuners on the old classic fenders. I have to say, I absolutely love them, really. They're as straightforward and as dependable as you can get. Um, and I remember having a having my JV Squire that I bought when they first came out in 1980, early 83, I bought mine new. And um, it came with these tuners and I played that for 35 years or something and the tuners never gave me the slightest bit of problem and in combination with the nut that I happen to have on that guitar I don't think I ever recall having had any tuning problems at all in the whole time I had it um, which is probably why I never learned anything about how to make a guitar stay in tune in all those years because I was lucky Of course, most of those years I also didn't play with other people for most of those years, so I, I didn't sort of uh, get that situation where you're suddenly out of tune and you really notice it because you're playing with other people and you've suddenly got to think about retuning in the middle of a song or something. So I'm just bedding the strings on a little bit, careful as I get to the top ones, we don't want to bust them. There we go. Um, Right, what am I doing? Um, yeah, we're going to get the tuner, the tuning fork, we're going to tune up first. Okay, so first thing we'll do is we'll do the whole 
manual stretching thing. Get all the slack out of the strings like I did last night on the on George's Epiphone. And oh, ow, my thumb. Get it all stretched out. This would probably take less time than the Epiphone did. Um, knowing electric guitar strings. But we'll still do it a couple of times at least until we go, don't get any more detuning for the same reasons as I talked about on that other one. Uh, remember, if you're new to this, I know Tim will have heard this before, but if you're new to it, um, your tuning stability is down to two things equally, 50% each. Half of it is a condition of your nut. Go oh, wrong one. <laughs> condition of your nut and the other half is the unreleased slack in your strings. What you're hearing now is, is the effect of the unreleased slack being pulled out. We've done the bit with the, the nut, we've got the best material which is Tusk. Um, we've made sure that friction is as close to zero as we can make it, so there's nothing, no strings getting caught and snagged in that nut or pinging or dragging. And then we've got the first fret action perfect too. The slots are factory molded, so there's not even any raggedness from the files, nut files. So that nut is as good as a nut can be. We've got a string tree made of tusk as well, so that's taken away that butterfly metal, that little metal butterfly clip that sometimes drags the strings a bit too. So we've got the friction part down to absolutely nothing, and now we're stretching out the, the string slack. So how close we are there. So we're very close to being on in tune there. So let's now take care of the intonation. And then after that, we'll check the down movement of... Now, what am I, I, came, I came over here for a reason. There's always a good reason. Uh, lead. Yes. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll check the intonation, set it if necessary, and then we'll take care of the down down only tremolo so here we are if anything that's a, a tiny bit uh, Sharp. Then we'll just pull it back a bit lengthwise. Spot on. I expect that to be sharp. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take my reading now off all of, off the first E. I'll just do a quick move of all of these um, pull them back to where I think they should be visually so they've got to come back a fair bit the problem is with these of course is we really do have to slack them off ideally to move them because they do get a bit stiff if you don't slack them off first I want to get a good proper movement so trust the pattern that's two groups of three staggered and they follow a very normal and dependable kind of pattern. And I'm just resetting that pattern now just by eye down here because I know what the intervals are for a, any standard set of uh, three wound and three plain strings. So it's kind of yeah, standardized. So 
of course when you slack the strings off you get a little bit of slack built back up into the tuning pegs or wherever so you need to give it a little extra stretch again So now if we go B, spot on. Perfect. Now we want a downward movement on the tremolo without there being uh, too much force. We don't need to fight, we don't really want to fight the springs. That's nearly the point. What we want to do is we want to take the uh, claws and just bring it out, uh, slack off the pull on the springs until you're uh, able to Drop the tremolo the slightest touch. Lovely. Now what you don't want is the tremolo uh, to come up when you do a bend, right? So you might hear. See that goes down or or in this case Can't keep my hands out of the way. So that's probably a tiny bit too loose, even though I like the feel of uh, how it was to bend it downwards. It just means that if you're running a, an open note and doing a bend um, with your fingers, um, it's, it, it's set at such a light touch. That's fine. There we have it. That's done. I am complete and it's gone nine o'clock so I'm getting home. So there we have it, the Mark Knopfler uh, signature strat. Mm, much happier than it was I think. Um, and um, yeah, with a little gentle down only move. Um, actually that one needs doing up a tiny bit. Gentle down only move compared to uh, before which was just a little bit a little bit over the well it was a little bit stiffer to say the least I'm just gonna check the plate always touches the base, you can always hear it click down on the back. There's no way to avoid that, I don't think, because um, otherwise it would have to be up. I was thinking sometimes of putting a little piece of tape behind it so it just touched down on that instead, um, but it wouldn't really make that much difference. I might just deaden it a tiny bit. You know what I'm getting at? A little piece of cloth, so we try this. Yeah. See what I mean? A little bit better than... And you could do that by putting a piece of Gorilla Tape underneath. I mean, it holds the plate up a tiny fraction, but, um, you know, if you didn't like the, the little clunk, 
not in the arm but in the plate hitting down yeah like I say get a piece of Gorilla tape stick a little thin strip to the underside and you'll get just rid of that that little clunk anyway there we have it signature Mark Knopfler Strat set up lovely new nut perfectly nice first fret action sorted out frets on a very peculiar fretboard I have to say um, everything else done strap button felts on done up tightened up uh, check the alignment down the neck everything's good oh yes we've just got to put on the oops that's the thing I always forget to do put on the uh, that thing it's otherwise known as um, the back plate oh and one thing I will check is the the bend see where we ended up on the bends as a result of the uh, sanding and everything odd position to put this in this plate should be about six mils forward or five mils forward of where it is so you can get the strings in and out as it is it's nigh on not very good but it's a bright white one so I've got a feeling that it's a replacement I don't think it's original because it doesn't feel like it's for this guitar position and it's the wrong color for this guitar so who knows Tim will know but I don't think it's the right plate I can't see Fender just getting it that wrong that you, you put the f a, a plate on with the screw holes in sorry the string holes in essentially the wrong position for a either a hard tailed or down only uh, strat uh, tremolo sorry anyway so that gives you you know a single ply white which is not a color you associate with this custom uh, not custom the signature guitar since the front plastic is all taking great trouble to be parchment see what I mean I don't I don't make a lot of sense anyway we don't mind so this is on there that's it all done thank you for watching see you again soon <laughs>